you think about the Astros? You think they had a chance? You think they had a chance? You think Altuve is going to hit a few home runs? What do you think? Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. So I got a, a confused a few people last week, I think, when I said that um, the pandemic was still going on. I was making a comment about President Biden's comment was over. And I want to explain a little bit. So if you look, the world numbers are really good. World numbers are coming down. But if you look at the map, pretty much all the continents except Antarctica are involved. And there's still cases everywhere across the world. So we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Now, things are getting better. And the more appropriate thing to have said, I think, uh, from President Biden would have been, uh, we can start behaving differently. You're treating the treating the pandemic differently because right now the numbers are really, really uh, improving. If you look, even Japan's coming down. But Russia's big, Russia's got some issues, but one of the issues they have is their, their COVID numbers are increasing. And, I just blew up the last month or two, and you can really see uh, Russia's going up as Japan's coming down. But Europe still has you know, got some hot spots. Uh, I had friends who went to Portugal, all, both came back with COVID. Uh, Spain uh, still has a lot of uh, COVID, and the UK and the United States are about the same. The good news is the, in the United States, cases are finally coming down, and it looks like they're staying down uh, pretty good. And if you look at hospitalizations, they're down another 9%. So hospitalizations continue to fall, and particularly over 70, the high-risk group. Now, uh, mortality is also, I mentioned, a lagging indicator, but it is coming down. So that's all looking good for the country. And if you look at the state of Texas, also improving. Harris County finally is at a low number by the CDC's evaluation. We, we're down below 100 cases per 100,000 under 10 admissions per 100,000. Our friends in Dimmit are still considered moderate risk, but really it's such a small community. You get one admission and it changes the number. So there's also low risk. So Texas is doing Texas is doing very well. In the Texas Medical Center, our numbers are continuing to improve. We're down to 5% positivity for patients that are tested here. Uh, our hospitalizations continue to drop. We're almost under 100 hospitalizations per day last week. And, of course, the best news and the best predictor is the viral load in wastewater. Remember I mentioned a couple of weeks that it plateaued, and I was a little bit worried because of the emergence of that new uh, variant, BA4.6. But it looks like even now uh, that's coming down. So that's, that's really good. And, and as we think, you know, about how the pandemic may change, one of the good news, one of the best things that's happened is the emergence of variants is getting slower and slower. So... You know, before we every three months, four months, we'd have a new variant. We haven't had, we've, we've got a new variant, 4.6, but it isn't really taking over quite like I was worried about. And if you see it, it's, it is growing. It's now up to 11 or 12% of the cases, but it's closely related to BA4. Uh, if you recall, when Omicron emerged, there were about 20 to 30 different vari uh, variations in amino acids between that and Delta. But BA 4.6 is closely related to BA 4 with only, you know, seven very only seven changes, and so it's closely related. Which means if you have an immune response to four or five, you're you're certainly going to be responding to 4.6. As the variations in the virus slow down and the world gets more and more immune, then we have the better and better chance that this would simply go down to something that looks a lot more like the flu and is seasonal changes. But until we see that seasonality, like in Australia, we, you know, in their wintertime, it gets like flu, it, it, it shows, and then it comes to the United States. That's when it's endemic. Uh, right now, we're still in a pandemic where all parts of the world still have infections. So I want to talk a little bit about one of the real emerging problems, which is long COVID or post-COVID conditions. And these can last weeks or months. It's usually found in people who had more, more severe COVID, but anyone can have it, even if you had a mild case. I have a persistent cough, for example. Uh, people are not vaccinated against COVID-19 are most likely to have uh, longer, or they're more likely to have long uh, COVID uh, conditions. And since there's no test, it really is sort of a clinical diagnosis between you and your physician. The CDC looked at 2 million records, and what's surprising was one in five people between 18 and 64 years of age had long COVID symptoms, and one in four over the age of 65. So it's a very common uh, condition after being infected. And the symptoms are general tiredness, fatigue. Some are respiratory, like a persistent cough or difficulty breathing. 
Some people have had arrhythmias that will feel their pounding of their heart, their GI symptoms, uh, muscle and joint pains. But the thing that's really uh, been, to me, the more, more, more intriguing is that there are a lot of neurologic symptoms. This brain fog syndrome, many people complain about headaches, sleeplessness, um, changes in smell or taste, and, and generalized anxiety. And there was a study uh, that was published in Nature, looking at Nature Medicine, looking at the VA database, and they looked at 154,000 veterans 12 months after they had been infected to see whether or not they had any increase in neurologic conditions. And remarkably enough, uh, it was almost a 50% increase in, in neurologic conditions that you can see here. That anything beyond the dotted line means there's an increase over the controls. And one of the largest increases was in cognition, memory, and memory disorder, sort of that brain fog syndrome. And so it really was fairly common, shown in a very, you know, really large cohort. So what is the cause of long COVID? Uh, there's really three hypotheses that are out there. One is that there's persistence of the virus, that you can detect virus in people for a long period of time. There are two studies so far that have supported that. One was in gastroenterology uh, that looked at 46 patients uh, with inflammatory bowel disease and they did biopsies serially, and what they found was in 32 of the 46, they could find viral RNA or viral antigens in CD8 T cells from the gut. So that suggests that the virus is still persisting somehow. There was also an infectious disease journal uh, uh, study looked at 29 patients who had chronic fatigue, and they found a positive RT-PCR uh, in urine or stool from uh, between 40 and 70 days. So normally we talk about clearing the antigen and the, you know you become PCR negative and after about eight to 10 days. Well, this is 40 to 70 days. So this is, this is persistence. That might be one hypothesis. The other hypothesis, the second version of this is maybe it's from uh, COVID just stimulating the immune system. And this, this dysfunctional immune system leads to the sense that you're, you're, you're sort of chronically ill. And they looked, there's one study that looked at uh, 31 uh, long COVID patients who had fatigue after three months, uh, and this was in, in uh, nature. And what they found was that long COVID patients had highly activated innate immune cells, lacked naive TMB cells. In other words, all their TMB cells were still stimulated and showed increased expression of the interference uh, one and three. And so and that was in nature immunology, suggesting that the immune system gets revved up and stays revved up. There was a fascinating paper that uh, Michelle Mange, who was just visiting here, uh, published in Cell just uh, this last July. What they did was take a, a mouse model and take a, a SARS-CoV-2 type virus, an engineered virus that was restricted to just the lungs of the mice. When they infected the mice, what they found was there was incredible central nervous system effects. So an increase in uh, cytokines in the cerebral spinal fluid, they detected CCL11 in increased amounts. There was an increase in microglial activity. There was a decrease in oligodendrocytes and decreased myelination of axons. So all these things suggested that the inflammation in the lungs of mice led to a central nervous system disorder. They went and looked at humans, uh, 48 subjects who had long COVID, and they were able to detect a similar increase in cytokines in the cerebral spinal fluid. So fascinating study in cell that really speaks to the fact that these lung infections with SARS-CoV-2 lead to a response in the brain, an inflammatory response in the brain. A third possibility that was uh, published from a group in South Africa thought that there was an increase in vascular damage due to microclots. Uh, there was, they took uh, plasma from 11 patients with long COVID and were able to find uh, evidence of, of increased clotting. So maybe that contributed. So there's three sort of hypotheses, maybe it's one or both, or a combination of all three. But there seems to be reasons why people get long COVID syndrome, and it's going to be obviously something we have to study. We have a long COVID clinic, and we hope to be able to answer some of these questions. So this week, I want to end with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, congratulations to Dr. Huda Zogby, uh, who received the 2022 Elaine Redding Brinster Prize Award from the Penn Institute for Regenerative Medicine for her, her work in identifying the genetic basis of two uh, neurologic diseases, spinal uh, cerebellar ataxia one and Rett syndrome. So congratulations to Huda. Uh, also, uh, the DHR hospital in Edinburgh, Texas, renamed its level one trauma center to honor Ken Maddox, our own Ken Maddox, professor of surgery at Baylor for his dedication to trauma surgery. 
Their, their hospital was recently designated a level one trauma center and named it after Ken, so that's fantastic. Uh, this week we hosted the 10th annual McNair Scholar Symposium that created it was created by Robert and, uh, and Janice McNair. And uh, we, we had a great symposium, brought together all of the scholars, and actually Michelle Manje, the author of that cell paper, was our, was our visiting speaker. And of course, in Dimmick County news, congratulations to the JV and freshman volleyballs for sweeping the Somerset Bulldogs. We always like to beat the Bulldogs. Final shout out this week, of course, goes to our own Houston Astros, who clinched their fifth American League West division title in the last six seasons. Lily has her home team jersey on, and she is a big L2B fan, so uh, we're all excited about what's going to happen in October. Our boys in October are going to take it all in. Lily will be there rooting them on. So have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you. Here comes Altuve, he is safe!